My guest today is Aaron Schatz. Aaron, how are you? Hey, I'm good, man. It's August. It's time to talk football. It's uh, football. we got preseason games coming up. Uh, the conundrum here is that I, I love football, but I hate cold weather. So while I'm sad to see summer go, uh, excited to see football on its way. Uh, as a segue to that, Aaron, I'm, I'm kind of curious how you first fell in love with the game of football. Oh, I mean, I was just a fan. I mean, I, you know, I was a baseball fan first, and then I got into football. And like most people in New England, I got into football when Bill Parcells showed up, right? I think a lot of people think that the Patriots got their following because of Belichick and Brady, but it's not really true. They got their following because of Parcells and Bledsoe. So that's when I became a really big fan. And then I was a radio disc jockey in Florida for a while, and going to the sports bar that had Patriots games was the way I stayed connected to home. So that's when I really got into football. And then it was after I came back from Florida that I, um, you know, started playing around with football staff. You are credited with being one of the originators of the way we use numbers and stats and analytics. Now, what, what made you sit around that bar and think there's not enough, to, we're not using the data properly. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I read the hidden game of football in the late 90s, the new edition, the second edition of the hidden game of football. And I felt like, why is nobody updating this? And this was, you know, the early Internet era. And I'm like, somebody should update this for the current game. And then I was like, you know, I could either be the hundredth person to start a baseball stats website or I could be the first to start a football stats website. And the NFL is only the most popular sport in America like let's do that so that's what i did and you started the almanac and it's not quite 20 years old right yeah this is our 19th book the first uh, preseason annual we did was called pro football prospectus 2005. so it's been through a couple of title changes and 19 years what is the biggest thing you, you've changed over now you with ftn now what is the biggest change from the first book to this book, maybe in, it may, maybe like as, as far as importance of what we're looking at number wise now. I mean, the biggest change is the adding of charting stats, right? Like when we started doing it, all we had was play by play. Now we have charting for things like cornerback coverage and offensive linemen and pass rushing other than sacks. Uh, we didn't have any of those stats when we started. But I mean, we've learned a lot over 20 years about, you know, fumbles being random and the importance of the passing game and the, the fact that blowouts tell you more about a team than close wins. And, you know, we've incorporated all of that into the research that we do in the book and what we write up about this coming season. I have it right here. I wanted to make sure I have it right. DVOA measures a team's efficiency by comparing success on every single play to a league average based on situation and importance. And right? opponent. And, and opponent. That's right. Yes. Not what? importance, interestingly enough, right? It doesn't actually highlight the most important plays because that's not predicted. Right. Okay. Yeah, I thought, interestingly enough, also, it's it. part of what it does is say one running back runs for three yards, another running back runs for three yards. What makes the run better is also part of, you know, we've been doing in this series this summer, we've been doing a lot of analytical stuff just because it's important. And frankly, I don't know a ton about it. So I figured if I don't know, there's probably a ton of other. So like when I read it that way, that made good sense as to what we're trying to figure out, what the numbers can support that maybe just watching it on film can't. Coaches think of things in terms of situational football. And the stats that I started doing 20 years ago were really the first stats to think in terms of situational football. The fact that down and distance matters, right? And three yards on third and two is good. And three yards on second and 10 is bad. And we've incorporated that into our stats. How has it changed? You know, over the years, we have certainly moved from what was a defense heavy, run the ball kind of game, where now we've, we've totally moved it into a passing league. What with the rule changes and everything, are there are there some numbers that have significantly changed in importance because of the way the game shifted? I mean, more and more. Uh, Teams are successful on offense. More and more they pass the ball. They use shotgun more. 
you know, we uh, in the analytics community, we ride this hobby horse about fourth downs. My God, we talk about it nonstop about how teams need to go for it on fourth down. And part of the reason why it's a good idea to go for it on fourth down is that offenses are better now than they used to be. And therefore, you are more likely to convert. And if you give the ball to the other team, they are more likely to score because you want to, it, it has made, the, the rise of offense has made possession even more important than it used to be. And therefore, you don't want to punt the ball away if there's a good chance that you can keep it by going for it on fourth and one. Do the, have the numbers started showing, well, two things, let me, let me do this first. Are we getting ready to head backwards? Do you think you know the 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 game is about evolution? It's all about it's also about pivoting. I think so. While for Washington, who will be employing a lot of six DB sets, let's say, and and as we see the linebacker being less and less valued, how quickly do you think we're going to before it takes teams to get back to? Well, listen, if we're if they're going to continue with the light box here because of the passing rules, then we'll just start sledgehammering again. Do you think I we're think, heading that way? I think we're not there yet. I think there's a while to go before we get to the sort of, you know, harmony of running and passing where we move back towards it being more of a running lead. The passing is just, and has been for years and years and years, passing is just more efficient. Even in the 80s, passing was more efficient than running. And that, and is that the biggest reason? Other than there's usually one main running back on a team, is that also the reason why we're seeing the position devalued? Well, there's so many reasons why we're seeing the position, the position devalued. One of them is passing being more important than running. One of them is an understanding that the offensive line plays a larger role in the running game than we used to give it credit for. And part of it is that the average running back is really good. Right. The problem is not that there are good, great running backs are not great. OK, the problem is that good running backs are also great and average running backs are pretty good. And so you can find a guy in the late rounds like a Tyler Algier or uh, Isaiah Pacheco and get good value out of them. And therefore, like the difference between a first round corner and a sixth round corner is much larger than the difference between a first round running back and a sixth round running back. And that's a big reason why running backs are being devalued. There's just too many of them. Right. And and there's only 32 teams and most of them only want to use one. Well, no, a lot of them use two. They use committees. They use committees. I think teams have discovered that committees are, are better than usually than having the one workhorse uh, because that if you have an injury, you've got backups and, you can use guys with different styles, and that also has dropped the salaries of running backs because you no longer have those workhorses. I'm curious for a team like the Commanders last year that were like in the top five for overall defense, but were so and were extremely good on third down, amazingly good on third down last year. But the, the turnover that they got, they were at the bottom of the league. Where where do we rank the importance? Like I guess for like I was telling someone the other day they said well how what what happens when the commanders regress a little bit on some of those that they were just so ridiculously good at like third getting off the field on third down so, how important is it to realize that, that if they can move up the turnovers this year then they should that balance them out some absolutely you're talking about two important trends that are opposite one is that your third down performance normally moves to be like your performance all the time and the other is that if you're low on takeaways, you're going to have more takeaways in the future. And if you're high on takeaways, you're probably going to have fewer takeaways in the future. So, yes, Washington is very interesting. And the Jets, by the way, also qualify for this because they were really good on defense last year, despite not having a lot of takeaways. Most of the best defenses have a lot of takeaways. And that suggests that both Washington and the Jets will stay strong on defense this year and in fact we have washington with a top five defense in our projection it's interesting the way that that washington has built the defense uh i've been on this podcast apologizing to jack del rio several times when he when he and ron got here it felt like it was antiquated maybe the game had passed them by but they're kind of in the forefront now of this 
multiple DB sets and really using a front four that they that they don't have to blitz. They they like to rush forward. That's because they spent so many resources there. Two things. The DB movement, I'm curious your thoughts on, but also this notion that maybe the interior pass rushing is now being valued, if not at the same rate that the outside rushes are, it's getting closer. It doesn't feel like it's been that way in a while. Do you see I think you're absolutely right. Yes, teams are using more and more dime personnel. First of all, uh, the idea of base personnel is completely wrong at this point because no team's base personnel is four defensive backs. Every team base personnel is 11 on offense, three wide receivers, and nickel on defense. And then you also have a teams that use a lot of dime on defense. So you only have one linebacker in there with four defensive line. Usually it's a 4 1 6. Some teams it's a 3 2 6, but normally it's a 4 1 6. And you're absolutely right. The importance of the interior uh, pass rushing. Certainly guys like Aaron Donald really moved the needle on that and uh, Dalvin Tomlinson and um, uh, what's his name from the Giants who's uh, I'm totally escaping my mind. Saquon uh, Barkley. Uh, no, the defensive uh, tackle. Um, oh, oh, yeah, uh, Dalvin Tomlinson. No, no, I, 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 the other guy. Who, yeah, I can't remember Dexter his name Lawrence, right Dexter now. Lawrence. But, Dexter, but he, Lawrence. Dexter Lawrence. He's very good. Um, yes. But uh, that – uh, interior pass rush is absolutely, I think, considered more important than people considered it 10, 15 years ago. Yes, and it's a big part of the commanders. And have you, do you subscribe to the, the way they put that defensive line together with using so many resources on that group? Uh, assume, assuming that Montez Sweat and Chase Young play really well, and they get contracts as well. Can you, can you afford to give four defensive starting linemen humongous top of the market contracts it's hard i don't know if you can afford to give four you can certainly use four first round picks though like i'm not going to yeah. argue with they're using the first round picks i don't know if you can it may make sense to let one of the pass rushers go and and uh, and try to do pass rush another way and just have three exorbitant salaries on the defensive line um you know i haven't done research to know you know just how much value each additional star on the defensive line brings compared to the you know do you have two stars or three do you have three stars or four but it, it would be a lot of money it would be a lot of money to keep on four of them i'm curious your thoughts and, and if you you may not know but you know cam curl the safety for washington is going to be due for a contract soon it'll be one of those interesting issues they don't do a lot of winning when he's not on the field and it's noticeable how much better the defense plays but because of the role they ask him to play he hasn't had a turnover since his rookie year i wonder when it's time for negotiating how the two sides will kind of mix that where it's like yes you're important but you're a safety that doesn't get turnovers i, I think that turnovers are overrated for what defensive backs do you're only talking about four or five plays per year right coverage and tackling yeah. play a much larger role in what a safety is doing on the field than a couple of turnovers and so i would hope that washington would judge all the you know defensive backs uh by all of the plays and not just the splash plays and um, you know given that i think that the organization is going to go in a more analytical direction under the new owner i wouldn't be surprised if that's the case Football teams don't win games without good quarterbacks. That has been Ron's problem since he's been in Washington and the guy before him, so on and so forth. It feels like they have an opportunity with Sam Howe to move in a direction with a guy that I think can play a little bit. What do the numbers show? What do you think? Can they? It's hard, it, can you do anything with a little? You can't victory? expect. You can't expect. You you can't expect it. There's so such a little track record that all you can go on is that this guy was a fifth round pick, and your expectations for a fifth round quarterback with no track record have to be very low, right? I mean, you could be wrong, right? Howell could be much better than that, but your expectations have to be very low. Like it's very likely that he's going to be bad. The team went. Eight, eight and one last year with a backup level quarterback. 
the problem last year, more than anything on offense, they they didn't get to the they they averaged just under 19 points a game last year, which when you think about it, seems incredible that you could even get to eight wins while not averaging 20 points a game. When I think the league, league average is around 23. What will the enemy offense look like? It, with lots of RPOs, I'm assuming. Will they dumb it down? Do we do we have any idea what his role was in building an offense at all? No, I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, I think people thinking it's going to look just like Kansas City, they don't have the tight end that Kansas City has. So that in itself is going to look – I mean, if you if you model your defense to the players, uh, the offense to the players you have, not try to fit the players to the scheme, but to the scheme to the players, then you have to de-emphasize the tight end. We don't know how much of a role the enemy played in forming that offense in Kansas City. So we don't know. We can't say whether he's good or bad. Like we, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think the assumption is, you know, given that a lot of us wanted him to get a more high-profile job, the assumption is he'll be good. But there's nothing in the numbers to tell us that because there's nothing that tells us that anything that happened in Kansas City was directly related to him. Do we have any idea what's kept him so long from getting a job? Because I, I hear him in, I, I hear him doing the past. Exactly, past exactly Washington. what I just said. The idea that it's Andy Reid's offense and right. that he's not the mastermind behind the offense. It's Andy Reid's offense. That's why the enemy had to get another offensive coordinator job where he had more power rather than going straight into a head coaching job because, you know, I think the view around the league was we have to see what he can do on his own. There were two kind of, I don't know, big, big openings. One of them was big because it's the team that I root for, I suppose. But, you know, the commanders and the Ravens both had openings for their offensive coordinator position. Uh, I'm also a lifelong dogs fan, so I'm very familiar with Monken. Uh, if you had your choice between the offensive coordinators, is there one that you would have preferred? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, no, I wouldn't say that I know enough about either of them to, to have preferred one over the other, to be honest. But it should mean good things for Lamar. In a, in I mean, I think everybody pass, feels like they're, they're, everybody them. feels everybody feels like Roman's offense had gotten stale. Receivers were like running routes that were running into each other. Like the passing game is going to be much better with Monk, and I think everybody feels that that, that the offense is going to be better with Monk. And they have the tight ends um, to to support supposedly what the offense would look like if it's similar to what the Georgia offense was with the tight ends they had. There. Well, it's interesting, yeah, because you know. If Bateman is healthy, you would think they'd want to go three wide with Odell, Beckham, and Zay, Flowers, and Bateman, but they also want to go a lot of two tight end because of Isaiah Likely. So, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of two tight end with them. But they're not going to do is use a fullback because apparently Patrick Ricard is uh, moving to the offensive line, which is a wild story. Feels like he'd have to put on a bunch of weight to get there. A little bit. I saw you on uh, Good Morning Football the other day. You made your Super Bowl predictions. Uh, tell us what they are here. And then very interestingly, I, I'm curious how you use the data because you have been right a bunch recently, right? Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is I've diverged from the specifics of the numbers a little bit each year. Like I never tend to pick the top two teams in the projections. I tend to pick like teams that are like third or fourth sometimes. And um and I've gotten right five of the last 10 Super Bowl teams. So my pick is San Francisco and Buffalo. We have Buffalo as our number one team. They do have a very hard schedule, but I just feel like Kansas City can't win it every year. One of these years, Josh Allen is gonna do it. They're in big salary cap uh, trouble if they don't do it this year. I feel like this, this, this could be the year for them. And then uh, in the NFC, we have Dallas and San Francisco neck and neck at top of our projections. And I, I kind of like San Francisco because when the chips are down, I trust Kyle Shanahan more than I trust Mike McCarthy. Yes, I know there's right tackle questions. Yes, I know there's quarterback questions. But um, I think that Purdy or Lance can do well in the Shanahan offense. I have less confidence in Sam Donald. Uh, I think they can figure out right tackle. I mean, every team has a hole somewhere. So theirs just happens to be at right tackle. Um, and I think San Francisco should be a very good team overall. 
offense and defense, and they have an easier schedule than Dallas and an easier schedule than Philadelphia. Yeah, I saw that. I noticed that the win total for Dallas is quite large in the Almanac. Is is it is it the biggest win total in the NFL? Yeah, they have our highest win total by like decimal points over San Francisco. They're our number one uh, as far as wins go. They're our number one. What are they to do in San Francisco with the quarterback spot? I mean, it's Purdy. I, it's going to be. Do they, get, do they get? They, do they get re- credit for not forcing Trey Lance, even though they spent so much yeah, to go out there and get him? It's wild. It's, it's wild. Uh, yeah. Some team is going to want him, right? Like you've got to figure out what he can do. But I understand why they're going with Purdy. They got good performance out of him last year. He understands the Shanahan offense. They're going to stick with him. And I think they're going to get good performance out of them again. It, to that point, though, are you surprised that at some, at some point they're going to run out of value with Trey Lance, right? There won't be years left on the contract. There won't be the, the fifth yeah, year. He's you know, gonna, you're going to burn through some of that stuff that makes rookie contracts really exciting. You'd think you'd at least want to recoup something at this point because his value only goes down, right? Right. I mean, I think he's going to stick around until he becomes a free agent, and then he's going to sign somewhere that will let him start. I know it's wild. The Trey Lance story is not what anybody would have expected. Who do you, who do you think it was that wanted to spend all those picks to get up there? Do you, do you have any idea who that was? No, I'm not. I mean, no, I'm not really inside to know. Was it Shanahan? Was it the ownership? Um, but I, I can't imagine that they would draft a quarterback that Shanahan didn't want. He's the mastermind behind the offense. You know, he, if, I'm he sure wanted, he – I can't. I, I think the stories that he wanted Mac Jones instead that don't make logical sense to me. No, I think I think he probably saw shades of RG three when he looked at Trey Lance and and thought about what yeah. is possible in that offense with a guy that can that can move his legs and also throw the ball long. Uh, Eric, I'm curious. What what are some if you had some other uh, surprises from from the book that you could share with us? Some. So maybe some teams that were way down that you have way up this year, things like that. Our biggest surprise is the NFC South because my big prediction is two NFC South teams will make the playoffs. Even though the winner of that division last year had a losing record, I think Atlanta and New Orleans, their schedules are so easy that all they have to do is be average teams and they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, as far as teams we have lower than everyone else, Minnesota was terrible in our numbers last year. And they went and lost talent in the offseason. So I just don't think they're going to be very good. We have Chicago lower than other people do. I think the expectations for Justin Fields just seem out of uh, out of line with what he's done so far. I mean, I, I want to believe like it would be fun if Justin Fields was good. It's just not likely. And we have Miami a little bit lower than other people do. Uh, you know, you've got to expect a little bit of regression on offense, given just how good that offense was last year on the deep throws. And on defense, Vic Fangio was a great addition, but Fangio does not have a history of instantly turning defenses into number one defenses. It takes him some time. When he went to Chicago, that defense was terrible in the first year, and it took a couple of years to make them number one. So I, the idea that he's going to go to Miami and they suddenly are going to have a top five defense doesn't really fit his actual history. And I guess finally, the, the Vegas has Washington at six and a half wins. You'll take the over or the under on that? I will take the over. We have Washington at 7.6 average wins. We, we, just, we think their defense is going to be you know, top five, top eight type defense. And even with the problems on offense, uh, that means that they're going to be good enough to win more than six. Uh, and last one, I know you guys switched over to FTN. How have you found that tr- transition? Yeah, I don't know exactly where my permanent home is going to be. I'm sort of in the middle of figuring that out. But FTN has been amazingly supportive for doing the Almanac. Uh, they've been really great to work with. Their charting data is fantastic. A uh, really good group of people. So it's been a positive experience. Uh, you know, it's been a weird few months for me, but uh, working with FDN on the book has definitely been possible. I lied, Aaron. One more. How long does it take to put the book together from the time that you start doing the research to the time it drops on the shelf? Well, this year was weird. Uh, usually it's like three months. This year, it was like I was doing a little bit, doing a little bit, and then all of a sudden in July, we just did the whole thing. 
Okay. So <laughs> uh, this year was a strange uh, schedule where we got it done much faster than usual. Usually it takes longer. Aaron, thank you, man. I appreciate your time today. I know you're insanely busy. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. FTNFantasy.com. Look for the picture of Patrick Mahomes. Download the PDF version of the book. And the physical copy should be on Amazon very soon. It's in review right now. And I'll include a link uh, when I shoot this out on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you.